Maggie Ellison, welcome to Head on Fire. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome back to the rebirth of my podcast. This is the first time you've been on it as Head on Fire, so welcome. That's true. <laughs> I, I was on a former podcast that had a different yes. name, but it is good to be back with you. Uh, I, I'm so excited to be talking about this book, uh, number one fan with you, but more importantly, I am so excited to be talking about what this book is about and the conversations this is going to create. But for the five people out there that are listening to the show that don't know you or your work, give us a brief rundown. So my name is Meg Elison. I'm a speculative author of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I'm also an essayist and a nonfiction editor for Uncanny Magazine. I make my living selling words in novels and essays primarily. And uh, I love telling stories about gender and about what it is like to exist in the world, whether or not that includes spaceships and ghosts. So tell us a little bit about your latest book, Number One Fan, which is a about to be out yes about to be out yeah uh, about august to be 30th out. 2022 so this this show will have j- just come out i think yes look at that uh, a few days beforehand so go out and pre-order the book pre-orders are Definitely. very important <laughs> the most important yeah uh so i used to live in the san francisco bay area and i went out one night and had a few too many drinks as one does and I realized I needed to get home. So I called a rideshare app, you know, in my phone mm-hmm. and had a car come for me. And I remember the city sliding by. I remember the lights of the bridge. And then I remember nothing else. Mm. And I woke up because the rideshare driver was reaching back from the front seat and shaking my knee very gently. But they had been trying to wake me for a couple of minutes and I hadn't woken up. And when I finally came to, they were like, you're home. And I was home. And that was good. But as I stumbled to my door and tried to get the key in the lock, not succeeding the first couple of times, it occurred to me that it could have woken up anywhere and that I would have had no idea. And that was kind of the beginning of the idea for number one fan. So it was a combination of that and thinking about how much fandom has changed, how much parasocial behavior has changed since Stephen King's Misery came out in the early 80s and how differently uh, creators are viewed by fans now than was the case then. And the idea was just too delicious to let go. It is a very delicious idea. I've had an opportunity to read the book. Um, it It is probably the fastest read that I've had in years. Uh, you have a, a way of forcing me to turn the page, uh, sometimes against my will that I uh, am very envious of. I hate you a little bit. Um, but I'm I'm glad that you kind of invoked the name of Stephen King and Misery because I feel like um, a certain segment of internet book consumption culture is going to say the words Stephen King and Misery a lot in relation to this book. There's going it's, to be comparisons. Sure, yeah. sure. But in my opinion after having read the book, number one fan has about as much, in, as much in common with Misery as the Sandra Bullock movie The Lost City has in common with Misery, in yeah. that they are both about authors who are kidnapped against their will because the person kidnapping them has an agenda. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a really great movie from the 80s called The King of Comedy that has a very mm-hmm. similar storyline, like... Uh, uh, creator is is kidnapped by crazed fan is by no means unique to see your gang. How so? I know this is going to come up a lot. How does this specific instance differ from misery? Why? Why are I? I I, I hate to ask the question this way, but I just I just know that people are going to say these words too often, and I want to address it directly. How is number one fan and misery, how are they different? How are they similar? And why are we telling the story now in 2022 in this way? I'm a huge Stephen King fan. He is a great influence on how I write and how I view stories. I grew up reading him like a lot of Americans did. So I can't deny that misery was in my head when I was writing this. So here are some things about misery. Misery is dependent upon a particular set of gender politics where it is humiliating for a man to be physically dependent on a woman, where it is unusual that Annie Wilkes is so physically large and strong for a woman. 
and there's kind of a warped sense of motherhood like she becomes the monster mother the terrible mother to paul sheldon the author who is completely dependent on her there is a great deal of gore in misery that is not replicated in my book although there is there are plenty of bad things that happen and the central issue of the parasocial relationship is different so in their time the relationship between annie wilkes and paul sheldon is marked immediately as that's too much that's crazy that's beyond the pale Mm -hmm. in our time where people literally make a living running uh, accounts that repost content from their favorite celebrity or when people are watching their celebrities faa trackers in real time to see where their private plane is going or when they are obsessively tracking um anything that their favorite celebrity wears or markets or accidentally has in the background of a tiktok video it's a whole different animal and it engenders a different sense of entitlement and ownership between writers and fans and that line is often very blurry so number one fan takes place in a different universe than misery as much as it may owe misery for inspiration the two are not occurring in the same time there is a pretty clear discussion on the page about uh, ownership of work, the online book community convention life. Um, why was this ground that you wanted to cover on the page? I, I Mostly, I feel like so many authors these days are terrified of upsetting book reviewers terrified of saying that maybe the way that we consume books or discuss books itself that discussion is problematic even though i'm not sure the word problematic is the right word there but um is is uh uh harmful in some ways both to people that like books and people that want to write books um that 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 the way that we are currently consuming books is is not great all around People tend to shy away from those topics because we don't want to make the reviewers mad. We don't want to make the online social media discourse. We don't want to be the main character in that discourse. So uh, worst thing that can happen to you, yeah. Yeah. So why did you want to take that on? Because you you do have some pretty clear thoughts on the page. Uh, the pandemic aside, I've spent the last several years on the road promoting my books, doing conventions, doing bookstore events, doing live readings and panels and pretty much every engagement that people ask me to go to, I will go to. <laughs> and it has been fascinating and really edifying and I think great for me as an artist and great for me as a person, but there are some really dodgy moments in that process too. And it's really strange to realize that your book is not the product, that you're the product and that your continued maintenance of your platform and your availability and your personability and your time are ultimately what people want to buy and you don't want them to buy one book you want them to buy all your books Mm -hmm. you have to be accessible and friendly and charming and down to earth and you know helpful to people who want to be writers you have to dole out advice on top of everything else and this has only happened to me on a very small scale but living that life pointed out to me how vulnerable that position is for a creator and how easy it would be for someone to use all of that availability to turn it into a weapon. And I remember reading in uh, accessibility and usability forums for new technology, the question is often, how could someone use this in the worst possible way? You have to imagine yourself out of your own mindset. Like, yeah, it's great. Your kid has an app on their phone that allows you to track them in case they get into trouble. How is their abusive ex-boyfriend who you know nothing about going to use that same data? And thinking about the applications of that access got me into talking about the dark side of conventions and uh, and the kind of events where you literally sell the opportunity to hang out with you. You're selling selfies with you. You're selling, you know, stand in line and get my autograph and what that means. Who owns a work once it's released to the world? That's such a complicated question. (laughs) As a copyright holder, as an IP owner, as a writer, of course, I want to believe that I own my work. I want the sole exclusive right to publish and to reproduce and to decide how it's going to be 
optioned and uh, translated and adapted. And, and I want that to exist for me and I want the right to pass it on. But I do think the copyright has to have an end. I think that the, the US process of life of the artist plus 80 years is very fair. And that uh, efforts on behalf of corporations like Disney to circumvent that in order to keep Mickey out of the public domain are ghoulish. I think that. So you are a pro Winnie the Pooh slasher movie? <laughs> I'm pro Winnie the Pooh slasher movie. I absolutely believe that our core texts have to be reinterpreted and that most of the best things about our culture is that we reinterpret our core texts and let them become something new. Uh, but at the same time, like, I don't think that people should be able to write fanfic of a living author's work using their characters and their world builds in an unlicensed way and make money off it. But I do think that fan fiction authors who aren't profiting should be left the hell alone. I don't think Anne Rice or anybody who'd like to follow the example of Anne Rice should be, you know, threatening them with baritry for engaging in what is, after all, a hobby. It is deeply complex. And then, you know, you have the the odd IP use cases of people working within license on an established franchise, like the many wonderful authors who are turning out books for Star Wars or the Star mm -hmm. Trek universe or the uh the marvel or dc expansions like that sarah daly working on slayer or daniel jose older writing a book about lando calrissian like those are great and i think they add a great deal of diversity and new voices to a long established canon and to frankly media mega corporations that are buying up every single myth we own so that nobody can ever reinterpret them but it's not it's not a simple question it does not have a simple solution so uh, i cannot say for sure who owns anything i can say that i own myself and my ideas and i hope you own yourself and your ideas and i hope we both get paid um there is a level of ownership and assumption of ideas of characters, of character arcs that uh, very quickly turns into very angry discourse on the internet uh, because, well, I read a character this way as having these traits that are not explicit on the page. I read a character as, you know, or I, I think that the author intended X, Y, or Z. Um, I've asked other authors this, but I, I want to ask you this because so much of your book does deal with those people, those people that do feel a sense of ownership. I mean, I've seen tweets that say, if a person from this community reads this character as this, you should never say otherwise. We have, we have now, that character is now, has now, has, possesses this trait forever yeah. and ever. And if you ever disagree with that, even though it is not in the text, even though we cannot assume what the author intended, if you ever say it, it's it's otherwise you are you are now problematic. You are now part of the problem. There is a level of revisionist ownership of work that is done online and through readers and stuff. How much do you think that authors should? care about that conversation? How much do you think that authors should interject intent into that conversation? Or do you think that authors should just go off and live on an island somewhere and never have access to the internet? Because that's more and more what I would like to do. Ah, I would love an island. Uh, but I have to <laughs> stay online to do my job. I do think that authors should stay the hell out of those conversations. Ultimately, it has nothing to do with the author or their intent. Like 40% of the experience of reading a book comes from the reader. And that's, that's a conservative estimate. Most of it is what we project into it, what we see in it for ourselves. I think it is best for both the health of the community and for the mental health of the author that they stay entirely separated from those conversations. I don't think writers should read their reviews on Goodreads or Amazon. I don't think that amateur reviews are for writers. They're not, they're for readers. And I think that writers should absolutely refrain from arguing with people who reframe or interpret their characters in whatever way they see fit, with one small exception. I think that if readers are reframing or claiming your work to promote fascism or you know, murder 
uh, you know what? There's a great example. Uh, the song Tomorrow Belongs to Me by, uh, I want to say it's Hamlish. It's in Cabaret. It's in Cabaret. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like a parody of a neo-Nazi Aryan nation anthem. And it's written by a Jewish songwriter to put into a Broadway show about Nazis. And real life Nazis unironically co-opted this anthem to be their like marching song. I know, I know. It's just like a spiral of hellishness. And uh, the songwriter is no, lo- no longer alive, but his, his heirs, his children pointed out, he's like, this is my father making fun of you. This is my father uh, making sport of how ridiculous your movement was. And every time you sing this, you need to remember that you are using a Jewish man's art and, uh, and more than likely putting money in a Jewish man's pocket if you're like playing it on Spotify or whatever. I think you have every right to reclaim your work from turfs or fascists or, or people who are trying to use your work to promote ideology that hurts people. The rest of the time, you should stay the hell out of it. Yeah, a, a a very a much more recent example is uh, I think Neil Gaiman uh, coming out on Twitter to say, "Death can be black. Death is black. Death is all things. Death is nothing. Everybody. Death death yeah. is the concept." I'm so sorry that you are so triggered because we cast a black actress in the role of death for our TV adaptation of a 30 plus year old comic, but it's okay that death is black. <laughs> And in those cases where it's a question of casting, I think it is important to remember that you're not defending the work as written. You're defending an actor who now has that role and has to deal with this blowback. Like Kelly Marie Tran in Star Wars was an absolute yes. Sunday. I mean, that yeah. should not have run away the way, the way that it did. Uh, so defending those people who take on those roles, who have every right to play those roles and have won them through their talent is also a necessary step. For the most part, as a writer, uh, you're not defending another person. You're just arguing about the legitimacy of your work and how you'd like it to be seen. And that's that's not your job. Talking about ownership of work, uh, in many niche communities, plagiarism and copyright infringement is rampant. Uh, books are found in whole for free on blogs and websites like Etsy, which confer an air of legitimacy on those purchases to people. They, oh, well, I found it on Etsy. I found it on Pinterest. I found the art on Pinterest. Uh, with people on the internet claiming that authors should simply be grateful anyone wants to read their work at all, uh, that the public has a right to these works, or even the more sympathetic, well, I can't afford it. Um, I think if anyone understands each of these points, it's you, the author of Find Layla, a person who's been very open about your own uh, financial background. Uh, you've been very public about growing up in abject poverty. You exist at the intersection of multiple marginalized communities and have written in each. Do you sympathize with the arguments for obtaining free work? And how do you protect your work without becoming bitter against internet book consumption culture? I do sympathize. I was a book pirate when I was in college. Uh, however, and I feel like this is an important distinction, I only pirated textbooks, which as we all know are sold at a significant and unnecessary markup to college students. And I, I found it, yeah, that's exactly it. It's a double middle finger situation because I wasn't paying $400 for this year's economics textbook when a PDF of last year's is functionally identical and cost zero dollars. So I, I pirated textbooks and I distributed those pirated textbooks to others. That's my Oh, I, I, yeah. I remember people, people, one person would buy the textbook and they would cut the, cut the binding off and take it over to Xerox and they would, and then they would sell those copies. copies. Yeah, yeah. For like 20 bucks each or copy. something. Yeah. I would show up the first day in class and be like, this thumb drive contains the textbook who would like it on their laptop. And there you uh, go. that was my job. Yeah. But I was a, you know, a poor struggling community college student with uh, many thousands of dollars worth of textbooks that I was required to buy in order to earn a degree so that I could live, uh, which is different. You're not going to fail your classes and fail to get a job because you can't get, you know, a quarter of thorns and roses. So uh, the argument of affordability. First of all, artists don't owe, owe you affordability. And second of all, libraries exist. Libraries exist in every community and are free to use. Libraries offer books in audio format, in large print format, in braille format, and books that are not currently available in your local library can be interlibrary loan to you for free or for very cheap. So uh, I love library users. I, I know for a fact that they produce lots of reviews and I know that they keep my books in circulation and I will die grateful for the work of librarians and for people who use libraries. And that costs zero dollars. I don't take 
direct action against book pirates because, and this is an important thing to know as a writer, it is also not my job. Many things are not my job. It's my publisher's job to defend my copyright and to defend uh, their right to print and distribute the book. I have a Google alert on most of my titles, like most authors do, just in case you come up in the press, you want to know about it. And one of my alerts every day is a Russian pirate site that has one or more of my books. I delete them and move on. I, uh, I, I struggle with that um, because I, I know in, in niche communities, especially uh, niche spiritual communities, a lot of people, um, they don't want to have the conversation of class. They don't want to have, they don't want to make it about money. They want to make it about access to knowledge, access to information. In the nonfiction world, I've written a nonfiction book. In the nonfiction world, there is, well, the people are owed access to this knowledge. Um, and the conversation then sounds like it's a different conversation. Do you think that that's a different conversation or is it the same conversation dressed up in uh, morality. performative, I mean, yeah, performative yeah, morality? It is essentially a moral question. <laughs> Uh, I do think that at its core, there is an argument about people's right to information. I think people have a right to accurate information about the news. I think, you know, journalism needs to be supported and the news should be available for free. I think you have the right to accurate information about what's in your drinking water and, you know, stuff you need to survive. And then there's the question about the information contained in patents, like uh, the patent for insulin was given away and should not be available to be profited on. And yet here we are. And yeah, access to that information saves lives and it matters. No one needs to read a nonfiction book about witchcraft in order to keep them from dying. The, the, the idea that you are entitled to information that is not uh, wholly necessary to your existence is a little bit more difficult to prove. That's just, I deserve access to the things that I want, not the things that I need to survive, not the things that are owed to me by dint of my human rights. Uh, that's well, and you, 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 you know? bring up a good point. There's access to information. You can freely Google what are the dates of the Salem witch trials. Totally. Um, what you shouldn't be able to freely get is someone's deep dive research, In research exactly right. into, uh, you know, okay, well, what was the economic impact of the little ice age in the late 1600s, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and how does that then impact the Salem witch trials and what, what can we, uh, what information can we glean from that? There's a, there's a different story. You're not, you shouldn't have free access to somebody else's labor. That's it. It's the question of your labor. It's not, and you know, uh, journalism is labor and medical research is labor. Mm -hmm. And there are complicated questions about how, whether the state has a, a moral obligation to obtain those things or to finance them through tax collection. But, uh, but you know, the privately produced labor of your neighbors, not yours. You are both an author and a fan of authors, an exuberant fan of authors. All the time. Uh, I, I feel like I've asked this question already, but I want to ask it directly. What do you think is so broken about the way that current, the current way books are consumed and discussed online? And I ask this because this is so directly tied to your book, to the research that you did for your book. Uh, Eli fights so hard not to lose her identity, only for us in the end to feel like perhaps she never had it in the first place. But a sense of ownership of self is illusory or at least not afforded a person who is in the public eye. Um, so what do you think, what do you think people who want to create work should know before getting into that world? What do you think about the way that we currently consume other people's creative work? Uh, how do you think that that is, is going on online? And do you think it's broken or working just fine? I think it is great that people have the kind of access that they do right now to obtain the books that they want to read, to talk about them with communities of people. Like I would have killed for that as a kid. I would read these great books at the library and then have nowhere to go with my questions and my exuberance. And like, I couldn't tell enough friends about it. I certainly couldn't like put up a poster that said this book is great, which I essentially can do on Instagram now. And I think those things are good for the book industry. I mean, people are, are buying and reading more books than ever. And that is spectacular And these fan communities keep those things moving, these uh, book talkers and bookstagrammers and, and booktubers really get the word out. And that is wonderful. And I never want to discount it. 
I think the hard thing for creators and this, this is not just about being a creator. This is about being a person. Mm -hmm. It is imperative to learn the difference between your actual self and the self that you present online. And as much as you struggle to be authentic, because we all know that you have to be authentic to make it work, there have to be parts of yourself that are not accessible by anybody who can leave you YouTube comments. So there's a, there's a metaphor in the book that I use that a creator is essentially like the blank screen at the front of a movie theater. Mm. And the work that you produce and the way that people see it and the way that they're taking in the colors and the lights and the movement in, in their eyes are projected on you. They forget that they're looking at you. They forget that you're there at all because you're just a screen. And when they put up their hands or when they stand up, they take up black space on that screen and the work is now projected onto them. Those are not holes in you. Those are just shadows. I'm not saying that online life isn't real. It is very real and it has real consequences. But the ability to separate yourself from your work, from the way people talk about your work, from the way people are about you, from the difference between criticism and attack is absolutely crucial to learn and uh you have to you have to develop a circle of people who you can talk to honestly about your shortcomings and your mistakes and you need a, a trusty group chat and some very good friends to tell you when you fucked up and when you should sit down and when you should stop doubling down and when you need to stop tweeting through it and just get outside for five minutes but that is that's not just like publishing one-on-one stuff like that's go to therapy, know yourself, 401 type stuff. And uh, not everybody's up to it. And it is really hard to watch even very high profile, very successful authors come under the pressure of all that and watch it destroy them, watch it destroy not only their ability to produce art, but their concept of themselves. Speaking of high profile authors, do you... I don't know. I feel like a lot of authors these days uh, both dream of and dread the idea of going viral of your book, yeah. be, of your book. You know, there's that adage of every day there's a main character on the Internet and the, the game is to not be it. But every now and then there's a book that becomes the main character of book talk and bookstagram and all of that. And sometimes that's great. You get a you get a Madeline Miller that 10 years after publishing The Song of Achilles, very rightfully finally gets her due and a beautiful mm -hmm. book is finally given uh, a, a, the audience that it, it deserved. And then Circe goes on and so on and so forth. But then sometimes... Sometimes authors and readers and books don't quite know what to do with being the main character. Uh, and that can very swiftly go in the opposite direction. Do you want to go viral? Do, do you, do you want to happily stay mid-list for the rest of your life? What would you like? It is both dream and dread. Uh, I like being a mid-lister. Uh, I like <laughs> having I mean I get fan mail almost every day and I make a little money on my books and I, I can publish short stories when I want to and all, all that is great all that is better than I dreamed it would be of course everybody wants to hit the list everybody wants to have a big runaway bestseller I, I, I don't know that going viral is the the penny shade it's made out to be it takes a lot of virality to actually move books as you found out <laughs> but it also has massive drawbacks. So, I mean, as a first of all, as a woman who exists online, uh, I, I get a fair amount of shit just for existing and definitely for having opinions and uh, a lot of times for posting pictures, which is just the things that people do on the internet. And uh, I've, I've written a couple of things that have gotten me some, let's say, medium credible death threats. And anytime my work gets larger exposure or I have a tweet that goes viral or something, there's a, there's a ration of shit that comes in with the adulation. And that ranges from people explaining my joke back to me using too many words, all the way to a really terrible derogatory and, and uh, beyond critical cruel things that people just find that they need to say to you because their own lives aren't going so hot and they don't understand why you're getting what you get. It is not great to go viral. It is uh, overwhelming and it brings you into contact with people who have no context, no frame of reference for you and have no reason to show you kindness. And that is unpleasant 
to say the least. So uh, writing a book is a huge work of art. It is a huge act of vulnerability and self-expression. And the more people who see it, the less sympathetic the reaction is going to be. So it is comfortable to be a mid and be like, I have fans and my fans read me and they already love me. It's safe. And, uh, but you can't help but wonder, like if I had a bigger platform, could I be more famous? Would more people like me? And that's, you know, that's where the monkey's paw comes in. So I guess I'm going to keep dreaming of it and keep dreading it. And I won't know until I'm there, but I, I, I look up, uh, I, I really admire authors who are able to deal with a larger uh, stardom than what I have and stay secure in themselves and stay alert and aware and know when they need to log off. You know, what's interesting is that even then, when authors are able to sort of organically reach a bigger level, they're still only talking most of the time to their audience. They're not talking to the general public. It's, can't. it's only whenever we end up going the kind of viral that people outside of your typical uh your your typical audience find you that's right. when it becomes really bad when a comic uh writer who typically talks to people yeah. about comic books and comic book characters and comic book canon suddenly has a tweet of theirs find political twitter or something like that it's like Wait, no, no, no. We're all having very different conversations and very trying to conversations. unwind all of that. Uh, you, you that's see when that. it gets you scary. See the, you see the fallout in that. Like the, the main character is often somebody who is big in a, a really small subsection of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're from podcast Twitter or they're from black Twitter or they're from church Twitter or they're from mommy Twitter. And when they cross over into communities that aren't as aware of the norms and don't necessarily know what they were going for, it gets real ugly. Yeah, I've I've had tweets about uh, white supremacy and niche spiritual communities um, go viral and end up getting on like Russian news channels what? and then like death threats from like, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. And it's like, why do you all even care what I say? I don't I don't... You're just, you're the screen. You have a screen and they're just seeing what's projected on you. It's super weird. So because you're the screen and people just see what they're uh, what's projected onto you, how did you divorce yourself from your main character, Eli Gray? Because I've gotten to know you a little bit over the years and it does feel very Meg heavy in Eli. I how think did you Eli... how did you step back? I think that Eli is a much sadder version of me. Um, yes. Eli is a, <laughs> Eli's a person who follows some of my worst tendencies towards self-isolation. Mm. So one of the main problems in the book is that she wakes up in the basement of her number one fan and she doesn't have a girlfriend and she doesn't have close friends and she's not close to her family. And she knows that she could be missing for several days before anybody really knows that she's gone. Mm. And that is terrifying because all you really have is the knowledge that somebody on the outside will raise the alarm. So her best hope in the world is her assistant, Joe, who is one of my favorite characters of all time. So I have a large social circle. I have uh, several close friends, several partners, and uh, a huge number of people who realize that if I have been on Twitter for 24 hours, I'm probably dead. So I was thinking about what it would be like to have that kind of dreadful success that you were talking about. Like Eli is the runaway bestseller and has an enormous addressable audience and almost no one close to her, which is the opposite of what I have. I have a small addressable audience and a lot of people close to me. So if I were sadder, if I were drunker, if I were more isolated, if I had done less therapy, but had become more successful with my first book, uh, that's the lie. And I think that's the easiest way to create a main character is not to not to recreate yourself and not to try to be the opposite of yourself, but to take the traits that make you good at life or bad at life and magnify them. So she's, she's a distortion. Yeah. That's something that I've, I've had to learn uh, in my own writing is, Oh, this character is my anxiety. This character is my pride. This character is my, uh, my, my brash uh, nature, you know, that kind of thing. And then just take that and run with it and make them your best and worst selves. Absolutely. So then I must ask, because authors very often love talking about 
uh, how they identify with the hero, but how are you Leonard? Because all of our all of our characters come from somewhere inside of us and your villain is Leonard. And how is he you? And how did you separate yourself from him? Leonard really wants to be respected as an author, which is an easy vein to tap into. Every author wants to be respected. You want people to love your work and think you're a genius. And don't we all oh, yeah. want that? Yeah. <laughs> and he wants to get there through a completely uncompromised vision. He wants to be able to ascend through the great straight upward path without having to take any feedback or listen to editors or, or be accountable to an audience at all. And his his biggest mistakes are in his inability to see past that vision into other people. And, you know, the fact that they have wants and needs of their own and they don't just exist to bring him praise and tell him that he's great. Uh so I think that he is made up of my most peevish impulses and my most selfish ideas of what role other people have in my life. The, uh, the court of public opinion, your, the end of your book, I feel like when, when people start reading it, the end of your book, I think, could cause more conversation than the entirety of the first 300 pages. Um, the How did you come to the decision to write the ending that you did? And I don't, I don't know, I, I'll, spoiler alert, uh, I'll just say spoiler alert, just in case. Yeah, we are going to discuss the ending, but I'll I try have, to everything away. I have to discuss this ending because it is uh bold it is a bold several very bold decisions that you you wrote um but it's so important that a story like this and then i you know it circles back to my first question because i don't see how somebody can read the entire book including the ending and ever compare it to misery ever because that man got justice and eli does not so that's that's the essential difference between number one fan and misery is when a man goes through what Paul Sheldon went through in misery and tells the story, everybody believes him. Of course, they want the nonfiction account. Of course, they think she was a total monster. Of course, it's fine that she's dead. And there's no question if he's defending himself because we believe men. And when Eli goes through what she does, there's a lot of doubt. And I, I find that there's a real disconnect between fiction that tells us how cops deal with things like sexual assault and, and reality. And anybody who has had to report sexual assault to the cops or be cross-examined by a DA or go through the exams that you're administered after sexual assault knows that the system is not kind or caring or concerned with justice in the slightest and the way that I wrote Eli's experience of the cops as essentially an adversarial force and the justice system as largely unsympathetic and the court of public opinion being convinced until proven otherwise that she brought this on herself will ring true to anybody who's been through it. I'm not writing propaganda. I'm not writing SVU episodes. That is not how this goes in real life. I tried to write, I actually looked up like what's the mandatory sentencing for these crimes in the state of California? What's the likelihood that he would uh, actually get found guilty of any of it? And then what would he actually serve? And like, that's a small number for max sentence. That's the smaller number for what he'll actually serve. And uh, there is there is no justice, uh, not in the book and not in real life. So just to slightly elaborate for anybody who um, is intrigued but wants to kind of know what I'm I'm being vague about here, once Eli is rescued, because inevitably your main character is rescued uh, by the police, um, who are well written, by the way. I, I I was very appreciative that you did not make your investigator dumb. I, I don't dumb I don't this. support propaganda, but I do think that people need to understand that even the worst morally the worst investigators are still actually like good at the job of investigating um typically their morals or their their biases 
tell them to do different things, but at least in the technical aspects of their job, um, they're pretty good at those. And they're good at knowing when they're being lied to and picking up on red flags. Um, just bad people tend to ignore those or do other things with them, but good, good on you for that. Um, though I will say your, your, your investigator is not a horrible racist or misogynist or something like that. Just putting it out there. Uh, so your, your main character is rescued and then, you know, we inevitably see the fallout. You've got, uh, a, a, a villain who has been, uh, eradicated and they go on and, and you think that they are going to, uh, get justice against the villain. You think that they are going to, um, uh, you know, get some sense of closure, but instead they are subjected to lawyers, public opinion, social media that all used to be on their side in some way because they were this big best-selling author um, that are all now forced to uh, have conversations about, well, you went with him. There's this email chain that you have. You've spoken, you have spoken to a man in the past. Therefore, you must have been asking him to kidnap you and keep you in his basement for several weeks. Why are you, why? I mean, I understand that that, that is very realistic in the sense of we do that to women. We do that to victims. Yeah. Do you, oh, do you feel like do you feel okay with what you did to the reader there? I don't think, I think that there is a really, there's an important place for fiction about these kinds of crimes that serve up perfect justice. I think mm -hmm. that that is really cathartic and really important. I think that people watching Olivia Benson put rapists in jail is super helpful to somebody who's on a healing journey and be like, ah, oh, yes, that, that can happen. And it can, but I can't, think of a lot of stories where it shakes out like mine does mm -hmm. where where we talk about how humiliating that process is and how even if you get justice and your assailant ends up in jail you don't really get peace from that and you you don't you certainly don't retrieve your reputation you don't escape what people project onto you again as a victim and you know it was long after number one fan was finished but i was pretty physically ill watching amber heard get torn apart in the press because nobody believed her mm -hmm. and uh and i think i've just been served over and over in my life example after example of how much we hate and mistrust women and that is that is true from at any level of celebrity, you can be you can be a movie star, you can be the Secretary of State, and in the end, it doesn't matter because everything you say is a lie, and everything that happens to you is something you deserve. And even when Amber Heard's an interesting example, because the moment that a man is accused of something, there is immediate. In, uh, there's the immediate assumption that there is innocent until proven guilty. There's the benefit of the doubt. There is, there's got to be the an explanation. Destroying his life. Yeah. Right. Um, the minute that a woman is accused of something, or the minute that a woman accuses a man of something, suddenly there's, On well, her. there has to be a reason. There has to be a reason why he did that to her. Even if, even if the facts of the case are incontrovertible, um, there has to be a reason. I mean, you had to have wanted him to pull your fingernails out, right? This had to be a sex thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's just a kinky sex thing, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's all taken from life. That's all taken from real trials. That's all taken from real transcripts. Like, it has been employed many times in sexual assault trials. Well, did you ever ask him to choke you? Well, did you ever ask him to hit you? Well, how was he to know that this was not a funny game? Yeah. How long have you been wanting to kill somebody with a pen? <laughs> My because whole life. You you have your you have your main character who is an author very much do the pen is mightier than the sword. I and couldn't help it. I couldn't resist. I, I am the fountain pen person. I'm dealing I... with one as we speak. Uh, and I've injured myself with them in any number of ways. And uh, it, it's a really beautiful way to be wounded. Like you can absolutely cut yourself and be covered in emerald green ink. So I love the spectacle of it. And I love the idea of using a writer's tools to exact revenge. So couldn't help myself. 
Uh, yeah, uh, there there are not a lot of laugh out loud moments in number one fan. But when I got to that part, I was like, wait, wait, she's not about to. She's not about. And then you did. And then you did repeatedly. And it was <laughs> I I very much hope that this gets turned into a movie or a series, something limited series, Maybe. something, because I just want to see that scene. I want to see Eli stab him with the pen. I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I think I think this would for anybody who's listening, this would make an excellent adaptation to film and uh, <laughs> a, for the most part a tight two hander that you could shoot in a single location. Um, I'm saying, just saying. Um, where do you go from here? What are you writing next? What's what's next for for Meg Ellison? I am working on a horror novel about how another to one. Evil. Look yeah, at you. I, uh, I love horror. I love horror. And I, I hate dentists. And I, I would like to do for dentists what it did for party clowns. <laughs> so that is in you, progress. Right you think now. dentists just have too sparkling of a reputation? Uh, Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I'm thinking a, a beloved character that everybody can't get enough of. I mean, who doesn't want to go see the dentist, right? Yeah, they're they're so easy to to write about. I am concerned that I will not get any further dental work after this book comes out, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for you. I'm very excited for number one fan. Um you uh talked earlier about how much of yourself as an author you tend to have to give away kind of as currency. Uh, advice to new authors, advice to old authors, um, critiquing other writers' works, the business of the blurb, I blurb you, you blurb me. We we have this tacit agreement that we're nice to each other, <laughs> even though we might never speak. Um, what do you think about the currency of one's self uh, in these creative spaces? I think it's inevitable you end up using that currency it is i mean unless you can afford to just completely retire from public life and never see anybody like thomas harris gets away with this somehow the rest of us have to work for a living you have to find a way to use that currency oh this is a good metaphor so like uh fiat currency what you trade in public and with other people is a promissory note it's not the gold you don't move the gold the gold stays in your vault, the stuff that is truly intrinsically you, the stuff that brings you joy every day, the stuff that you protect fiercely about yourself and your life stays in the vault. You don't trade it. You don't let people carry it on the street. You let them carry the greenbacks. The greenbacks are good. There's nothing wrong with them. Spend them freely. Use them to create your career and create your persona, but hold on to the real stuff. Knowing what you know now about the business of being an author, is there anything that you would change about your, your early career? You're several books in by now. You're a, you're an established name. Number one fan is my sixth book that'll be published. And, and yeah, I have, I have emerged. There are some things that I think I would do differently because I understand the business better now, but things wouldn't have happened this way if I had done them differently. So I can't mm. really say that they're regrets. Uh, I will say that I sold my first novel without an agent out of necessity because I couldn't get the time of day from an agent. Uh, I, I, I sent out over a hundred queries in my first book and got back nothing. And I would prefer never to sell a book without an agent again. I, I know that it is worth it in every way. The contract is better. The deal is better. But selling it the way that I did got me the first deal that I had, got my first book into the world, got me the Philip K. Dick Award, like it's a set of dominoes. So I don't regret it, but I would tell any author coming up to hold on to their debut until they have representation. For the most part, it is not worth it to sell. What other advice do you have to, to new authors? Because this book very much very much is speaking to authors specific. It's talking to creative people, generally speaking, but it really yeah. does have a very unique kind of conversation. I don't even know, I don't even know how much I would have appreciated this book one year ago because my debut wasn't until last September. So this book, you know, um, I, I, I don't- It came at an interesting time in your life. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I would have felt about the book if I had read this a year ago and how much that would have changed because so much, I mean, I haven't experienced all of this. I've certainly not become any kind of runaway bestseller. I've had brushes with virality. I've had brushes with, you know, thousands of people reading your work and having opinions about who they think you are, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it is it is so interesting reading this now because it is such a very specific conversation to people that want to create for money in this world. <laughs> I think what? That, that's that's more people than ever. Like more of us have an audience than ever before. We yeah. are all, all of us trying to sell, trying to move that currency of accessibility and authenticity. Uh, so what I hope people will take from it, if you know, it's a page turner, it's a barn burner, it's a fun read. But beyond that, if it makes you think about your personal security, if it makes you consider whether you post your exact location online or whether you hold your Instagram photos until after you've left the location, if it makes you consider Hey, how many people know where I am right now? Am I sharing my Google location with anybody? Am I on am I on Apple Maps with a friend? If it makes you consider how drunk you are when you get into a car with a stranger or uh, how careful you are about who you share important information with about your whereabouts and your overall security, then that would be great. There are every woman I know who's a professional writer, when they have something new come out, we kind of ask each other the same questions. Like, did you lock down your site? Did you put 2FA on your account? Did you did you make sure that, you know, no one can hack you or destroy you in the days to come when you're getting all this attention? And it's terrible that we have to do that. It's terrible that we have to write with our keys between our fingers, but it is better to know these things than not. You're always the best at metaphors. Do you have a bracelet thumb drive? Or do you trust the cloud? I know you write in Google Docs. I know you do. And I I, I don't even trust a Google Doc. <laughs> I don't I, keep everything in Google Docs. I, I don't trust it. I do keep local copies of everything because you can't trust the cloud. There is no such thing as the cloud. I don't have a bracelet. I have other methods of backup. But the bracelet was actually inspired by the author, Kat Valenti, who has, uh, I think it's a Swarovski crystal necklace that conceals a thumb drive that has all of her books on it. And I loved that idea and I just thought it was so romantic that I had to run away with it. That's incredible. Uh, Meg Ellison, congratulations on another hit that I know is going to uh, make a whole lot of people want to vie for that number one fan spot in your life. I'm looking forward to hearing about it every time. Congratulations. On the new book. Um, so if people want to find out more about you in a way that you want, how can they do that online? Uh, please come find me. I'm Maggie Lisbon on Twitter. I'm Maggie Lisbon on Instagram. I'm Maggie Lisbon on TikTok. I'm Maggie Lisbon on Patreon. And you can find out my upcoming events and forthcoming publications at MaggieLisbon.com. I am so excited that I was able to woo you over to TikTok. <laughs> it's worth it. It is. Oh. I I hear you're doing an event near me soon. Is that right? I do. Uh, I have an event as part of ShyCon 8, which is Worldcon this year. Uh, we will be at City Lit Books on September 1st at 6 p.m. I'm appearing with Nino Sipri and Victor Manabo, two authors who I really, really respect. Uh, Nino wrote defect which is minimum wage at maximum weird and uh victor wrote the sleepless which is a new like what if post-apocalyptic story that is just wild so i'm very excited to be appearing with other authors and as part of the world con fringe and at a local independent bookseller and that is the official launch for a number one fan so we're going to do a little reading a little chatting a little signing uh if you're in chicago please join us please sign my copy when i come accost you at you know uh, at that bookstore. Maggie, listen, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me.